famous line, never doubt that a small group of citizens can change the world. In fact, it's the only thing that ever has, right? So uh, do you want to talk, John, or do you assume that these people already know the issues because they're with you? I think everybody knows what's going on, and okay. they may have some of their own issues that they want to address okay. as well. But we figured, welcome to the North Thank Country. You. Thank Welcome you. to beautiful Forest Lake. Thank you. And as you can see right over behind you is where they want to site a mega landfill for out-of-state trash uh -huh. that would impact generations of, uh, you know, citizens living here in the North Country. So, welcome to the North Country, Marianne. I think in terms of my running for president, I think my message is that this is a symptom. This is one symptom. But there are so many. And we're constantly playing walk and ball, aren't we? We're constantly signing it back. It's, it, it could be Forest Lake, it could be some other uh, environmental situation, it could be carcinogens in our food, it could be PFAS in our water, it could be wars that shouldn't be fought, it could be guns that shouldn't be on the street, it could be lack of health care, it could be <clears throat> people rationing their insulin, it could be people unable to find a place to live. I think that the burgeoning realization is that it's all one problem. And uh, I'm reminded of a line from Mahatma Gandhi that the problem with, it, with the world is that humanity is not in its right mind. This is not just bad for the environment. There's something insane about this. There's something insane. And what's insane uh, is the whole thing is sociopathic. You know, if an individual has no conscience and no ethics and doesn't think about any fragile cords that unite us to one another, to the earth, And uh, there is an economic paradigm, you know, in other generations it was slavery, or it was institutional suppression of women, or it was the Gilded Age, or it was segregation. There were specific institutional realities, and so the people knew what we need to do, needed to do. We need to abolish slavery, we need to uh, pass the 19th Amendment, we need to desegregate the American South. This isn't an operable tumor like that. It's a mindset. It is an economic paradigm, and it has spawned a, a cancer on our civilization. And even though we have to stand up in the individual instances to say for us right, we also have to stand up to the larger issue to save our democracy, to save our civilization, and possibly to save our species. Yeah. And that's how I see it as, pre as a presidential candidate that the undue influence, the undue economic influence, financial influence of this corporate behemoth, it's not just the environment, it's not just big oil, it's not just companies who own landfills, it's not just food companies or insurance companies or pharmaceutical companies or big agribusiness or big uh, chemical companies or big oil or big banks or defense contractors, they are part of a matrix of corporate overlords. This is no different than the landed gentry in England. That the entire revolution was to repudiate that. This is no different. And by the way, it's the same forces. It's the same forces. I mean, this is what we are experiencing. It's not something new. What's new is that people what is this? I thought this was the live free or die state. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I thought this was the live free or die. You know, Franklin Roosevelt said a necessitous man is not a free man. I, I didn't, you know, and he said freedom, we must have freedom from fear. Freedom from what? This represents fear for our children. Yeah. What are we doing? And so I believe that there's an awakening, but it's a slow awakening. And I think that it has been really, there's like mind games. And for my generation particularly, not so much for the younger generation, because they don't remember a time when it was much different. For my generation, we used to be able to look to this thing called the Democratic Party. We used to be looking to the Democratic Party. You know, you have a Republican, clearly a Republican, Sununu, who's gone along with this. And maybe if you had a Democratic uh, de uh, senator, maybe if Tom Sherman had won, whatever, then it would be different. But in terms of the larger picture, 
The Democratic Party is in too many ways complicit. And that to me is what Joe Biden represents. Joe Biden has given more oil drilling permits than Trump did. Joe Biden okayed the Willow Project. So my, my presidential campaign represents those who feel we have got to really rise to the challenge here. We have really got to rise to the challenge here. And to say that someone is better than Trump, I mean, if we talk about someone who has okayed the Willow Project and has given more oil drilling permits than Trump did, and has okayed the LNG, then on the particular issue of the environment and protecting it, I'm not sure it's any better. So I really, really, really acknowledge and feel grateful and admiring of all of you, John here, what you're doing at Forest Lake. And this is not a but, and we've got to realize that the same force, I mean, what is going on inside the human beings who run a company who for the sake of stockholder value, we have made unfettered vulture capitalism, a, a, it's become our God. It's become our false God. And I think that we need to look at this with as much seriousness and sobriety as our ancestors had, looking at, at any other institutional reality that was undermining everything that we as a country believe in. And I tell you, I meet a lot of uh, Greenwich staters who do not seem to know that among white Americans, a lot of the uh, early abolitionist movement emerged from early evangelical churches in New Hampshire. I mean, New Hampshire, this is really interesting about New Hampshire. I mean, that plus the fact that you are first in the nation, I love the way this state has been willing to stand up to the DNC, but even though it stood up to the DNC in terms of having your primary anyway, it took your Republican Attorney General to tell them to cease and desist, and yet I see so many Democrats acquiescing to this nonsense and buying in. I don't even know anyone in South Carolina who buys this thing about racial diversity being the reason. Even they laugh. Even they laugh, nobody buys that. So, unfortunately, there's the good news and the bad news. The good news is you're here. The good news is you're fighting back. The good news is you're gonna, I, I think you're gonna do it. You're gonna save Forest Life. I think what's gonna happen here, tell me if I'm wrong. My sense is that it's gonna be no different than St. Gobain. Uh, ultimately, it wasn't worth it. You know, those people in Merrimack just made it, it just became, too, it's too, you're, you know, I said to people when I dropped out of the race last time, and I feel it this time, my commitment to those who had supported me is that I commit to do everything possible to continue those who so deserve to inconvenience those who so deserve to be inconvenienced. Yeah. And that's what you're doing. You are making it really inconvenient for them to continue. Yeah. And that's what I, and, and you will win. You will win just like they ran St. Cobain out of town. It took so long. Yeah, it did, it did, and many people, I know, I agree with you. I agree with you, and I think your point is very relevant to what's happening right now. We don't have time. We don't, and that's how I feel about my candidacy. You know, when I think of my candidacy, sometimes I think, you know, it's okay, we are, you know, we're leaning in, and it doesn't even matter what person or what candidacy ultimately is able to represent the overthrow of this unfettered capitalistic nonsense. I, I don't even think, I, you know, I don't think of myself as anti-capitalist. This is a malevolent strain, right? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm pro-apple. <laughs> I like apples, but then there's such a thing as a poison apple, right? <laughs> and, uh, but we don't have time. We don't have time. And that's why I think your point about San Clemente, it took too long. How many diagnoses? So I, hope that all that you uh, as Granite Stater voters, I hope that you will see my candidacy as part of the larger picture that this particular race is part of. Uh, this corporate matrix of overlords now owns Washington. It has turned Washington into a system of legalized bribery. No different than Sununu going along with us. Yeah. This is no different.
and, and I, I wish I could say, but as long as we vote for Democrats, we'll be okay. Nobody buys that anymore. No. And yet, when I see the people who are continuing, well, we got it. We, the, the thing is, we, we got to go with Joe because Joe's the only one who can beat him. Mm -hmm. I, I, I would submit to you for your mature consideration, Joe will not beat him. Not only do I think Joe, based on all the polls and his diminishing popularity, not only do I believe uh, uh, he will not beat him, I want to tell you something. I'm not sure he'd even come in second. I don't think people have any idea what's going on in this country. There is a rumbling out there. There is an earthquake. And so at this point, I believe, uh, in order for those of you who do wish not to see Donald Trump be president again, I hope that you will consider uh, my contention that we will not beat Donald Trump by just warning people about Donald Trump. How are you going to say to a person, be very, very afraid of this attack on democracy when they're just worried about whether or not they can feed their kids? We have 39% of Americans who now say that they regularly skip meals. And, and I'm going to say it again, just in case anybody's heart is not penetrated by that, and whose mind is not penetrated by the absurdity of it. 39% of Americans now say that they regularly skip meals to, to pay for their housing. A, a, a majority of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. Describing a faraway land, some fairy tale. Many of us can tell you it's not a fairy tale. In the in the 1970s, the average American could afford a home, and the average American could afford a car and a yearly vacation, and one uh, one job, one salary could afford to uh, uh, to uh, afford a family. Respect for it. 
but I see uh, the military like I see a um, like I see a, a surgeon. You know, if we have to have surgery, of course we have to have the best surgeon, and I think the Ameri you know the United States have to have the best surgeon on hand. But a reasonable person tries to avoid surgery. And I, we need a, a peace academy just like we have a military academy. We need an army of peace builders just like we have an army of military personnel. Just like they play war games, we need to play peace games. We need to imagine a, a planet without war in a hundred years and reverse engineer from there. And let me tell you something to the people who say, oh, that's naive, she's so naive. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you what's naive is to think we can reasonably assume there will still be a human species on this planet in another 100 years if we don't at least try. And by the way, before I get off that, peace building is a real thing. There are four factors which statistically indicate that there will be greater incidence of peace and a lower incidence of violence in any, whether it can be a corner of an American city or a corner of the world, if these four factors are present. Number one, this isn't gonna surprise anybody, greater economic opportunities for women, greater educational opportunities for children, a reduction of violence against children, excuse me, against women, and a reduction of unnecessary human despair. Where people can thrive, there's less violence. Large groups of deaths with people, this is dangerous. Ask Netanyahu, ask Germany after World War I. And when you have large groups of deaths with people, you have a petri dish out of which uh, levels of personal and societal dysfunction are inevitable, including vulnerability to ideological capture by genuinely psychotic forces. What do you call the problem? What do you call what's going on? We, we're seeing it with our own eyes. And when, when Trump talks about what he wants to do in the second term, he's not lying to you. Hillary was right everything she wanted us about the first time. And he's going on and telling us what he would do the second time. This is blinking red light time. And Donald, and there's nothing to indicate except DNC concocted narrative that Joe Biden is the one who would do that. We need a Department of Children and Youth. We have, my God, we have little children in elementary school on suicide watch in this country. We have all over this country uh, public schools with uh, trauma rooms. Why should childhood in this such a rich country as ours be such a trauma for millions of children? If we're going to have, if, if I'm president, my job will be to be very, think all the time about what do we need for this country to be completely repaired and amazing in 20 years. And you know what we're gonna have to do among other things? Give a lot more attention, a lot more focus, and a lot more resources to children under, under the age of 10. We, we know things now about early childhood. They didn't even know 15 or 20 years ago, much less when this country was founded. And 90% of the brain is developed in that, first, uh, in that first five years. Next, if I have to declare a climate emergency, I will. We have to begin a mass mobilization for a just transition from a dirty economy to a clean economy. We must, and by the way, we will create millions of jobs in doing so. And the last thing I want to mention, and then I'll be glad to answer any questions anybody might have, uh, we should end America's war on drugs. It has devastated so many people's lives. It has not solved the problem, it has exacerbated the problem. When I was in college, we had 300,000 people in prison, and today we have over 2.3 million. And 46% of all federal prisoners are nonviolent drug offenders. So for the 100 billion we spent a trillion dollars on it, for the 100 billion that we spend a year, for a fraction of that, we could have uh, a world-class network of recovery options. I'll tell you how we're gonna handle the drug addiction problem. We're gonna help people recover. We're gonna help people get sober. I want to be the president who takes the word recovery and brings it into mainstream political ethers. I don't want a drug czar. I want a recovery czar. Most addicts want to get sober. And we can turn, we should do what nations like Portugal do and turn it from a criminal issue into a, a health issue. And also the one thing I'll say in addition to that, this will really help us at the southern border. Because one of the main reasons people uh, are seeking to immigrate here is to escape the horrifying violence of the drug cartels. Let's take away their black market. Yeah.
let's take away their black market. So, uh, that, you know, when Richard Nixon began the war on drugs in 1971, he knew that it was not public enemy number one. Uh, John Ehrlichman said it was all a ruse, uh, and uh, we can end it now. In the main part, to me, war is like, it's like a symbol of the whole country. What are we doing? What are you doing? Look what nature has given us. Look what the founders have given us. We, you know, I think sometimes, and this is, you know, I commend all of you. You're standing up not just for your rights, but for your responsibility. If you don't do this, who will? So I really admire you, and I hope that you, uh, that you can see that what I'm trying to do is, is what you're trying to do. And we are going to prevail. But on the political front, and, and also with this lake, you know, this, this isn't something that will be easy to clean up if, if this is allowed to happen, right, John? I mean, you know, we're, we're moving now into some irreversible damage uh, to our democracy as well as to our environment. These are blinking red lights. And I just believe we need to show up with the same characterological fortitude and conviction that our ancestors showed, whether it was abolition or women's suffrage uh, or the civil rights movement. We, uh, we're not a government of the people, by the people, and for the people anymore. We're the government of the corporations, by the corporations, and for the corporations. You are the people who live here. You're, you're having to fight for your right for a clean lake.